Okay. Um, I work with various problems of deep vertebrate evolution where I, I really come from a paleontological background myself, but I strive to integrate paleontological data with data from comparative developmental biology, genomics, and so forth. Um, because after all, all this information does bear on the same problems. We have a series of unique events in the deep past that we're wanting to understand. Um, and I think there is a great deal to be said for integrating data from as many different sources as we can. Um, there, does that sound a bit better? Okay, good. Um, what I thought we'd look at today, just a bit of fun and as an introduction to, to my work, is some problems relating to the origin of the head and the shoulder girdle of jawed vertebrates. So we're going to end up with our own familiar anatomy, which might help to make sense of this stuff. If I'm starting to bang on about something you just don't understand, put up a hand and stop me and I'll try to explain. Anyhow, um, if you look at the heads of jawless and jawed vertebrates, this is actually, ooh, look at that, this little red dot. Yes, um, you will find that they are different in all sorts of ways. Um, jawed vertebrates, of course, have jaws, we have trabeculae, this is a, um, a component of the floor of the, of the brain case underneath the forebrain. We have separate nostrils here, and if we have a hypothesis, and it opens anywhere, it opens onto the palate in us, because it's simply buried in the floor of the brain case. Um, if you look at uh, jawless vertebrates, you've got no jaws, you've got no trabeculae, and you have a single median and nasohypophyseal opening. Here you see it in a hagfish, looking kind of particularly evil. Um, hagfish there in a lamprey, it's less easy to see, it's there on top of the head. Um, so they're built very differently. And on top of that, jawed vertebrates have a separate shoulder girdle with a forelimb attached, except in a few cases where it's been lost. Um, whereas jawless vertebrates, cyclosterms, don't have this. Um, if we wanted to understand how these features have evolved, how the jawed vertebrate architecture in particular has arisen, um, we can gain a great deal of understanding from comparisons of extant forms, especially developmental biology. And I flag up, this is a, um, originally a diagram by Shigeru Kuratani. I have crudely added some extra color to it to sort of jolly it up a bit. But what it's showing is um, early development in a jawed vertebrate and a lamprey. And without going into detail, basically these things do their early head development in a very similar manner. We're looking here at the migration of neural crest streams, and it's essentially the same. Um, more of that later. Uh, but suffice it to say that while that can get you so far, it can't really get you the whole way. You need fossil data, and you need fossil data because fossils show us morphologies which lie outside the range of extant vertebrates. And they show us morphologies from parts of the tree that have no living representatives. So, some questions we could look at tonight. First one then, what do fossils tell us about the origin of the shoulder girdle? Secondly, what do fossils tell us about the origin of jawed vertebrate head anatomy? And finally, and you'll understand why I highlight this later on, why are osteostracans such a puzzle? This is an osteostracan. It looks like a harmless fish, but it's not. These things are nothing but trouble, and it's taken me a great deal of effort and time to understand how these fit into the story I'm about to tell. All right. This is a consensus phylogeny of vertebrates. Um, as far as the extant groups are concerned, this is a stable consensus we can accept as, as true. Um, what we're interested in tonight is the jawed vertebrate stem group, that this, that's this segment here, which contains both jawless vertebrates, nevertheless in the jawed vertebrate stem group, okay, and actual jawed vertebrates in the jawed vertebrate stem group. There. Um, in the next image, you will see this red branch segment fleshed out a bit. Here we are. Here are the cyclostomes over the far end. You really can't see this spot very well, but never mind. On the far side, you've got the cyclostomes. On the near side to me, you've got the extant jawed vertebrates, the chondrichthians, cartilaginous fishes, and the osteichthians, the bony fishes, and us land vertebrates. And in between, you have a range of fossil stem nathostomes. Now, among these, there are three groups that sort of stand out because they have ossified endoskeletons of the cranium. Um, there's always in um, 
invertebrates some sort of box inside which the brain lives. But if that box is entirely cartilaginous, as it is in these things, and it seems to have been down here, then of course it doesn't fossilize, and it's very difficult to get any information about it. In these forms, this box is more or less ossified. Typically, it's just that the surfaces of it, external and internal, are covered in a thin layer of bone. But it makes these forms much more informative. Um, two of these groups, Galeaspids and Osteoscorans, are jawless. The placoderms here are jawed. One thing to be aware of throughout this, this presentation is that in, um, if we look at the, the extant forms, they bracket all these fossils. We've got the jawless forms here, we've got the jawed forms here. Um, and so anything in molecular terms and developmental terms that's conserved between jawed and jawless vertebrates of today can be applied, as it were, inferred to have been present with some confidence in these fossil forms here. So we have this very helpful comparative cradle. It's very useful when it comes to things like early cranial development and what that tells us about the composition of the head, as you will see. All right, so I'll take up a few different themes tonight, um, and I'll start with the head shield, in inverted commas, scare quotes, um, and the origin of the shoulder girdle. This is an image from a paper I published of a bunch of colleagues in 2005. It shows uh, cell population data for mouse, um, specifically um, whether you have muscles, where you have muscles, I should say, with connective tissue formed from pharyngeal neural crest in green, whereas entirely mesodermal structures in red. And you can see that the kind of neck region of your mouse is, uh, is very pharyngeal, uh, whereas the shoulder girdle evidently forms some sort of boundary between the pharyngeal uh, crest and mesodermal domains. And it's a reasonable inference that this is in some way reflecting the extent of the original pharynx, sort of, you know, gill chamber region of, of a, a, a jawed vertebrate. But how did all this arise? What's the deal? Where does the shoulder girdle come from? Um, very natural to think of it as a new bit that has been added to the anatomy, but I'm going to suggest that that's actually not the case and give you perhaps a slightly surprising picture here. When we look at jawless stem nathostomes, we find that as far as pin paired fins are concerned, they come in two models. Some have one pair of paired fins, apparently representing the pectorals. Others have none at all. You never get pelvic fins. Okay, but there's also another character by which you can divide them, and then the divide is different. Some of them are just covered in scales, like these. Others have a consolidated head shield, so-called, at the front end, either covered in large dermal bones, like these, or tessery, as in these two, but always noticeably different from what's going on in the actual um, scale-covered body. You notice that osteostracans jumped between those two categories. Among these various forms, the only ones with the head endoskeleton inside the head shield ossified is these two, osteostracans and galeaspids, which you may remember go a little further down the tree. And osteostracans are the only ones that also have paired appendages. So they become rather interesting here. Thelodons and aspids here, well, maybe they did have a scapular coracoid, an endoskeletal shoulder girdle to, to support a paired appendage, but, but we have no evidence. There's just nothing to go on. Regrettable, but true. Osteostracans, however, do have scapular coracoids to which the pectoral fins attach, and they're the only examples of this in jawless stem nathostomes. And very strange they are. You can notice already, just looking at this seemingly innocent fish, that it's pectoral fins appear to come out of the back of the head, just in the way that your arms don't. Okay. They are, as I already mentioned, the most crownwood group of jawless stem nathostomes. All right, what we have here, some of you may remember this slide from Prague 2006. I like to re reuse and recycle whenever possible. Um, these are 
pharynxes of um, a galliaspid here, Diana Lipis, just in ventral view, an in ventral and sort of sagittal section views, an osteostrican norsal aspis. These are drawings by Philippe Janvier. They're beautiful and very accurate, but the, the problem with norsal aspis as it happens is that it's very difficult to work out how the scapular coracoid here spatially relates to the pharynx. Oh, yeah, just a note, by the way, this pharynx has got a pericardium attached to the back, so that's where the heart lay. You had this rather complete back wall to the whole rig. What I'm going to show you next is some not terribly attractive images from a, uh, a CT scan model I, I modeled crudely and inaccurately some years ago, um, but which is handy in that it shows what's going on with the scapular coracoid more clearly. Here you have, this is um, an osteostrican that has cornua, these sort of boomerang-shaped horns sticking up from the sides of the head. Here is the pharynx, again, that's the snout at the top and posterior down there. Here are the scapular coracoids, and here, in fact, this is the cornea, it's like that process there, yeah? And you have these three images of it sort of rotated round. So there is the scapular coracoid face to which the pectoral fin attaches. And here is a dorsal endoskeletal bridge. This runs up under the dermal skull roof, and it connects the scapular coracoid to the post-otic region of the brain case. There, it's not even like there's some sort of joint to something, it's part of the same cartilaginous structure. You see those bridges in, in ventral view, and here you have them again in, in an old figure by Eric Stiensche. So this is a very, very strange anatomical organization. If we try to look at this in, in sort of some of diagrammatic form, this is what we find. Um, Galliaspid, and probably things like heterostricans do, had an enclosed pharynx. It's entirely contained within the, um, the head shield, and there's no scapular coracoid. In osteostricans, we have again an enclosed pharynx. Remember, the heart sits here. And then you have the scapular coracoid that's attached, sort of like this gray here, of course, is the endoskeleton, and orange here is the dermal bone cover on top of the whole thing. A jawed vertebrate looks essentially like this. You have a separate shoulder girdle, you have separate nice you know, branchial arches, the whole pharynx is sort of broken open, and there is no, there is no continuity, either endoskeletally or dermally, between the skull and the shoulder girdle. The actual boundary of the pharynx would appear to be there, like you see it in the mouse. So it really looks as though you may have produced this not by building the shoulder girdle as a new structure around the back, but by slicing off the back part of the head shield. There's another aspect of this story which is interesting, and that is when you, you hit this when you go to the dermal skeletons. Now, here is the front end of the dermal skeleton of a flattened but otherwise very nicely preserved osteostrican superciliaspis. And I'm sure you're looking at that and you can't make a damn thing of it, can you? I mean, seriously, you're not saying anything because you're too polite, but if I do that, then it's easier to make sense of. Um, the thing that I want to draw your attention to is that while here we have scale rows, which of course reflect the Semitic organization of the body, here the whole thing is basically covered in tessera. You've got these nice sort of edge pieces, but there is nothing in this that suggests, that seems to reflect in any way the organization of the pharyngeal arches or anything like that. If you turn it upside down, you'd find holes for the gills open. I mean, you know, fair enough, otherwise the animal wouldn't work. But it's still not very impressive. Now, let's look at the jawed vertebrate. This is Dunkleosteus, um, big, fierce placoderm. And its dermal skeleton completely reflects the pharyngeal architecture. That's the dorsal half of the mandibular arch. It's the ventral half. That is the dorsal half of the hyoid arch. This is the rear wall of the actual pharynx. Um, something happens at the origin of jawed vertebrates, by which the pharyngeal architecture, which we know is there already in some form at least, begins to actually pattern the overlying dermal skeleton. And I wonder whether that might not actually be a driving factor behind the creation of head shoulder separation. So to sum this little bit up, 
the evidence from osteostricans and other jawless stem nathostomes with head shields suggests that the nathostome shoulder girdle originated by slicing off the posterior part of the shield, creating a new unit incorporating the scapular coracoid and the posterior wall of the pharynx. Of course, this is not a complete account, and it doesn't explain in particular that very strange hookup between the scapular coracoid and the back part of the otic capsules. Why are these actually in continuum? This is something that I would like to pursue further. But one thing, of course, we should be careful with, even though this is, I think, a, a nice beginnings of an account, we shouldn't forget, of course, that we don't know what's going on in these. We simply don't have any data, and it's quite possible, of course, that if you could dissect a live thelodont, it would give you, you know, ideas about the endoskeleton, which would, would give, us, give a rather different perspective to what I've outlined here. So that is as mayor. But leaving the shoulder girdle aside, let's move forward in the anatomy and have a look at the origin of the jawed vertebrate face. More diagrams nicked from Shigeru. Um, I haven't really done any science of my own, you know, I just kind of decorate the work of others. Anyhow, um, so I've already mentioned the major anatomical differences between jawed and jawless vertebrates, and we see these arising in head development very nicely demonstrated uh, by these three ways comparative studies between sharks, lampreys, and hagfish from uh, Kuratani's lab. Um, I mentioned already that early development of the cranial neural crest is very similar in jawless and jawed vertebrates, but late development isn't. And it's the late development that gives us these differences. Essentially, the anterior most block of, of um, neural crest cells to move down, what's known as the trigeminal crest stream, um, it, it sort of starts posterior to the eye and it splits in two branches. One that goes above the eye, that's the blue material in each of these images, um, and then one branch that goes below the eye, and that's going to develop, divide into a pink block at the front and a green block behind, okay? And then these, th th that happens in everybody, but then they start doing different things. In a cyclostome, the nose and the hypophysis form from a single placode, and the uh, pink, if you like, the premandibular crest stream extends forward as a pair of arms and meets around the front of this, thereby, of course, topologically creating a hole in the middle. There's your median nasohypophyseal duct, in which you will find the nasal sacs and the adenohypophysis. Whereas in a jawed vertebrate, the you have three separate placodes, one for the hypothesis, two for the nose, and the same crest stream nips forward into the space between the nasal and the hypophysial placodes, meet in the midline, push forward to make the trabecular plate. So you now have a hole ventrally for the hypothesis and the nostrils open forwards, or dorsally indeed. And of course, the, um, the green block here in your cyclostome basically makes the, the, the lower lip, in jawed vertebrates, part of it also moves forward and it makes the mandibular arch as a whole. Now that's obviously well and good. It, it, it helps immensely in terms of understanding the differences between these, but the, but the actual morphological gap between the adult, resulting adult morphologies is still very, very substantial. Um, if we look at this part of the tree, however, we will find useful additional information. In the next image, and that, along with a bunch of subsequent images, are taken from a paper by, by Dupré et al. from my lab, lab uh, in, in Nature in 2014, um, we're going to be standing this phylogeny on end. We rotate it 90 degrees clockwise, and we're losing this entire bit, which is kind of, you know, there's no information in there, so there's no purpose in doing anything much with it. So we're just going to put galliaspids next to lampreys and hagfishes. So here we go. What we, what's going on here, by the way, so that's obviously the phylogeny. In red here we have the jawed vertebrate stem group. Here we have sagittal sections of heads of a range of, of extant vertebrates, a bony fish, shark, lamprey, hagfish. And these blocks are showing just the anterior posterior distribution of derivatives of the supraoptic crest, the uh, premandibular infraoptic crest, and laid into that nasal sacs in red, hypothesis in orange with a black outline, just so that, because anterior posterior positioning here is going to be important, and you easily lose sight of it, what with all the other morphology going on. Key thing to note is that the pink region 
in the extant cyclostomes extends far anterior in um, the extant jawed vertebrates, it does not. And here, nose and hypophysis are very close together. Here they are much more widely spaced. Also note here, when we're looking at the brains, a lines on the optic nerve foramen there and on the vagus foramen there, so they are essentially to scale, if you like, to anatomical scale, that the forebrain in purply blue is short in the cyclostomes. Not necessarily small, but short, like a satsuma squashed end on onto the front of the rest of the brain. Whereas here in the jaw vertebrates is long. Okay, enough of, let's have a look at galeaspids. Galeaspids tend to look rather surprised, but that's not the mouth. Um, it's the nasohypophysial duct. Um, there's a very nice study published on this on the basis of a synchrotron tomography a few years ago by uh, Guy et al. Um, looking at a galeaspid shuyu, um, where they were able to show you know, these guys had a, um, an anatomy that was curiously antecedent in some ways to jawed vertebrates. There are certainly kind of cyclostome-like traits here. You know, you've got a nasal hypophysial duct for starters, but if you look inside that, you will find separate spaces for the nasal sac and the hypophysis, really suggesting that they originated from separate placodes because pushing between them, there is a little skeletal spike here, which they interpret, I think correctly, as the beginnings of a trabecula. You can't really get tissue moving in like that and breaking a, a, a placode. It's not how things tend to work. And so what I suspect is going on, plainly you have, you, you, you must have um, this region built approximately like in a modern cyclostome. You must have big blocks of um, uh, premandibular crest moving forward laterally like this because otherwise you're not going to create a hole in the middle. It's just not going to happen. But it looks as though perhaps you really had separate placards and a small subset of that cell population moved in between them to make that curious little spike. All right, so here's our show you here and here's its cranial cavity, of course not an actual brain, but the proportion's gonna be about right. You see again, very short forebrain. Now, however, we move on to uh, our own work, the Placoderm romandina, a very basal and early jawed vertebrate. Here it is, it comes from the Canadian Arctic. The reason why we were interested in looking at romandina was that it is one of very few jawed vertebrates that has a curious bit of anatomy whereby the nasal capsules are far back and there's a sort of upper lip thing that extends below it, not like a, a rostrum, which is anatomically further down. We wanted to see how these things are constructed internally. Um, so we, we synchrotron scanned it at ESRF in, in Grenoble, got quite beautiful results. You don't just get higher resolution than with conventional CT scan, but also um, very much crisper um, definition and, 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 a, and a more subtle degree of resolution because we're imaging basically, um, f we're using face contrast to image the refractive properties as well as the X-ray density of the bones. You pick up things like this. And what that means in practical terms is that you can do this. Let's see what's inside. Well, there's quite a lot of stuff inside. Here we have the uh, very thin perichondral bone layer uh, lining all the internal spaces. You can clearly see cranial cavity here, inner ears, and so on. There's a bit of damage, but it's not too bad because using symmetry mirroring, you, you can repair that, you can put uh, mock up nerves and the grooves and so on that we find in, in the outer parts of the skeleton and you get a rather complete idea of the anatomy. And you may already notice there's something very funny going on with the front end of the brain. That's the optic nerve there. Look how short the brain is. It just kind of ends. What's also of course nice is that we can do this. And it's moving. It's always nice when that begins to work, you know. So here we go. We can, by the way, these little green things that are floating in space are nerve traces for the lateral line canals in the dermal bones. So we just put them in there to kind of show where the dermal bones are. Nice view of the inner ear there. Um, at the time that this was produced, a couple of years ago, it was the most detailed rendition of a, a very early vertebrate brain case um, ever to have been presented. Obviously, arteries in red on the underside there, veins in blue. 
here and there. Um, the spaces inside the nasal capsule, well, you might have noticed the nasal capsule is actually missing in our specimen, but of course other examples are known, so we just kind of mocked them up in geometrical shapes to, to sort of match. But the key thing with this, let's just put an ear on, is that the front part of the brain is very short. You've got this sticking out, ventrally positioned um, sort of upper lip. Below that, the upper jaw attaches all along the edges here. And all in all, the only sensible interpretation you can reach is that this is basically a trabecular region. It's in the right place for that, but it's much longer and broader than in a modern jawed vertebrate. You can see it again here. That's a, a sort of an outline of the um, a sagittal section of the brain case, trabecular region there. This whole thing looks remarkably like Shuyu, but very, very unlike a modern jawed vertebrate such as Squalus. Note the spacing, for example, between the nasal sacs and the hypophysis here and here. Just to put this a little bit more in context, the brain is very similar in shape to that in a galeaspid. Nasal sacs and hypothesis are closely spaced. Telencephalon, the forebrain, very short. Romandina has a solid trabecular region. Um, so it looks as though the migration path for the, the uh, infraoptic uh, crest cells is nathostome like, but in size and shape, it looks like an agnathan upper lip. And blow me, the nasal capsule occupies the same place as the posterior margin of the nasal hypophysial duct in let's say, show you. Okay, so we can plop Romandina in there. This is cranial cavity, looks again very much like a jawless vertebrate. What's missing, that you saw there was one branch left, is like the more derived um, placoderms where you no longer have the kind of upper lip thing, but in other regards, they're still very similarly organized. Nasal sacs, very close to the eyes, forebrain, extremely short. So there we go, and it makes a lovely little coherent story about how we went from a jawless to a jawed vertebrate architecture. But look at this. So we said in our paper that uh, we had this large premandibular crest region homologous with the upper lip of cyclostomes, galeaspids, and osteostracans. Osteostracans, where are they? Why aren't they in the tree? What have we actually done to them? Well, the reason why we've not included them is that they are so difficult to understand. When you look at an actual osteostrican. And I should say, first of all, there are very good reasons to believe that these really are at the top end of the jawless stem nathostomes, that they are more crownward than galeaspids. They have pectoral fins, they have a nathostome-like tail, they have osteocytes, bone cells, they're the only um, jawless vertebrates to have that. But they were described by Erik Stiernschuh, who first studied these guys back in the 1930s, as basically being lampreys in armor. They have certainly, these are all Stiernschuh figures, they have a lamprey-like cranial cavity with this little nasal hypophysial duct that ends blind, no sign of a trabecula, anything like that. How on earth do you square this with a phylogenetic position? You know, they're not exactly close to lampreys, and the galeaspids here seem to be much more like jawed vertebrates. Well, I decided to have a look at this a while ago, partly because I was intrigued by some arguments that Martin Brazil had put forward in 2009 when he started arguing that placoderms were paraphyletic, spread out along the jawed vertebral stem, rather than being a little clade. Now, I think he's right about the paraphyly, but there was a particular argument here that I sort of bounced on a bit. He said that if you look at placoderms, these are placoderm, a couple of placoderm brain cases. This is a shark brain case. This is part of the brain case of an osteostrican. Eye socket, eye socket, the eye would be there and the eye would be there, okay? And he's saying, look at what the nerves do. Here we have the, high, the ner cranial nerve seven, high mandibular branch. In, in this sort of advanced placoderm, it does this. It's rather like what you see in a shark or in a human being. Um, but in this primitive placoderm, Brindabalaspis runs forward under the eye, and so does nerve five, and hey, look, he said, it's, you know, it's very like an osteostrican. All right, well, I decided I wanted to look a bit more closely at this whole issue. So, let's see then. Are osteostricans really similar to lampreys? Are some placoderms really similar to osteostricans? 
And if galliaspids have more nastum like cranial cavities than osteostrogens and cranial anatomy generally, why do they consistently fall below them in phylogenetic analyses? Well, I think I have the answer to both of these, uh, or to all three of these, and they are respectively no, no, and I'll tell you in a moment. Okay. Um, so just how similar are these two? This is a rather simplistic diagram. We need to look at how these animals are actually put together. And I think I've got a surprise for you. Here. These are brain cases of three different placoderms in ventral view. Here's Romandina that you've just met. Here's Brinda Belaspis, this primitive, supposedly very osteostrogen-like form. And here's an Arthrodire, Kustinoviaspis. And what I have done here, oh, let's put the eyes on. This is in ventral view, so in Brinda Belaspis, the eye will be entirely hidden. What we got here is the, in yellow, the high mandibular branch or the facial nerve, and in red, the efferent hyoidean artery. Both of these are going out onto the hyoid arch. And what you can easily see here is that although their orientation differs in the three taxa, they always remain parallel. Okay? Worth mentioning here, by the way, that of course the nerve really tells us about the spatial relationship between the brain and the hyoid arch. The artery tells us about what the pharynx, pharyngeal endoderm, and associated structures are doing. In these things, however, it makes no difference, as you see. This is just a point of a procedural point. We can also note that the uh, buccal hypophysial foramen that leads up into the hypophysis is not anteriorized in these forms. It's not moved in any way. So we can conclude fairly clearly that the pharynx in these animals does not move relative to the brain. The dorsal middle part just remains static. The ventrolateral parts rotate forwards. If we look at these brain cases in side view, it's also the rotatory transformation is also obvious. Here we have the same landmarks in Cushtonoviaspis, Romandina, and Brindabalaspis. You can easily see what has happened. Now this, of course, is straightforward. It's what you would expect. This is how animals work. You don't tend to shift to such important bits of architecture relative to each other. You play with shape. You, know, you pull and you push and you rotate, and that's all absolutely fine. But now let's look at osteostrogens. So here is Kiraspis. What I've done here, I've made a bit of a compound figure. This is the actual figure material from Stenshire. This is the roof of the pharynx. You can see these two bulges just about visible in the pharynx, which are the bulge where the eye sits and where the inner ear sits. Inner ear, of course, also here in blue. And here, I've just sort of rubbed away a bit, and I'm revealing the inner ear, the eye, and cra the, the track here for cranial nerve 7. And here is the efferent hyoidean artery. And look what's happened. In the osteostrican, they are no longer associated. And in fact, of course, when you look at the pharynx, you can see it's a neatly arranged transfer. You know, it's a very undisturbed looking, kind of serene pharynx with this lovely transversely organized spaces for, for branchial pouches but it's so anterior. That's a spiracular pouch there, as far as we can tell, branchial pouch one. These ought to be behind the eye. Instead, not only they, but one more branchial pouch in front of the eyes. It looks, in other words, as though the entire pharynx has shifted anteriorly relative to the brain without rotating. This is an insanely strange anatomical transformation. There's nothing like it in any extant vertebrate. Galliaspids, by comparison, have this perfectly sensible looking organization with a spiracular pouch and branchial pouch one just behind the eye, thus. Um, if we look at other groups, we don't have that much information, but in heterostricans, which you might remember a little further down the tree, um, you can sometimes see impressions of the gill pouches in, on the inner surface of the dorsal head shield. Inner ears, eyes, a couple of pouches in front of the ears, everything behind the eyes, very much like in, in the galliaspid, and very much like not only 
an early lamprey embryo, but also an early anathostome embryo. This is really a, a, an unmodified basic vertebrate architecture. It makes a perfectly good hypothetical ancestor for jawed vertebrates. And this, of course, is why galeaspids look so kind of sensibly anathostome-like. If we look at the uh, forms further down the tree, we have no endocranial information from these guys at all, but we can see that the gill openings are always posterior to the eyes, so likely they're essentially the same again. So, this anteriorly displaced pharynx is an autapomorphy of, of osteostrogen, a unique specialization, but it is also one of the strangest anatomical modifications of any vertebrate group. Bear in mind that we know you know, the migration of, of, of uh, cranial neural crest is conserved between lampreys and anathostomes, so presumably right across the jawed vertebrate stem group, including these guys. So the material that is going to go into the, uh, the, the, the hyoidean arch, uh, sorry, the mandibular arch and the hyoid arch, either side there of the spiracular and branchial uh, uh, clefts, is going to be coming down between the eye and the inner ear. But these arches end up up here, and we can only assume that the crest sort of, you know, moves south between the, the eye and the inner ear, and then extends forward in some manner that is very, very unlike anything that you would see in an extant jawed vertebrate, or any vertebrate. This also begins to explain, I think, this, the seemingly lamprey-like characteristics of the cranial cavity of uh, osteostrican, specifically that little nasohypophyseal duct which ends blind, just as it does in a lamprey, without going through to the pharynx. Because we know where the, the opening is on the upper surface, it's sort of up there. Where would you put the lower hole? There's nowhere for it to go. In a galeaspid, you can punch it straight through because up here you're in the mandibular arch domain or premandibular domain. Here, that's just a little bit up here. So. It's a completely different anatomical context to the nasohypophyseal duct of the lamprey, which is anterior to the branchial region. You'll all be wanting your first glass of slightly chilled white wine now and some, you know, taco chips. So I'll wind up at this point. But I just want to say, to summarize the, the kind of major points then, firstly, that the jawed vertebrate shoulder girdle probably originated by slicing off the posterior part of an osteostrican-like head shield. Um, and it happened in, the, in association with the imposition of pharyngeal arch patterning on the dermal skeleton. Secondly, that the jawed vertebrate face appears to have evolved through an intermediate stage where the forebrain was still short and the trabecular region long and broad, like a cyclostoma galeaspid upper lip, suggesting perhaps a decoupling between the, the control over migratory path for, for this ectomesenchyme and its degree of proliferation. And finally, but the reason why osteostrogens tend to cause us so much trouble is that they have the most extraordinarily bizarre head anatomy, where everything is affected by the anterior displacement of the pharynx, and they are not by any imaginable stretch of the imagination lampreys in armor. So with that, I'll wind up. I would just like to thank, first of all, the organizing committee for inviting me to speak, my major funding bodies, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, the Swedish Research Council, all my collaborators and members of the group, past and present, with special mention to Martin Brazil and Vincent Dupré, who did, Vincent did a great deal of work, in fact, all of the modeling work on Romandina that you've just seen. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Per, for a wonderful talk. Um, since time is advanced, we're only going to take one or two, a uh, maximum three very short questions. Are there any questions? Um, Shigeru, I'm just stunned. Okay, what could it be? No, thank you. <laughs> I'm very troubled by Tolimonstrum. I'm okay with the retina having melanosomes in it, but the anatomy really freaks me out. It's a very strange animal. I really couldn't tell you. I'm, I'm very unhappy about the whole idea of a, a vertebrate with a little kind of, you know, where's the inhalant water supposed to go, you know? 
Anyhow, yes, Shiguru. Uh, where do you um, uh, identify the uh, upper lip homologue in osteostracans? Uh, in osteostracans, I think, well, osteostracans, I think, have an upper lip uh, of quite sort of conventional uh, cyclostone model. Let's just find a reasonable picture of a, an osteostracan. I would say, of course, this is, this is ventral in view now, so it's a bit, but the mouth would be there, the buccal hypophysial, or sorry, the nasal hypophysial opening is about there on the upper si surface, of course, and, or, or there, in fact, and I would regard th this region up here essentially as being upper lip, although, of course, saying that because of the transformation of the pharynx, the actual oral chamber, if you like, proper, is very small. It's just this bit here. It's kind of the mouth and not much else. Well, this is, you know, more posterior pharynx. All right. Any further questions? I have a short question, Pierre. If the shoulder girdle is derived from the head shield. Mm -hmm. This would mean that the humerus of the forelimbs is matching up with the shoulder girdle only secondarily. No, not necessarily. Nope. We, it's the, the, the shoulder girdle of, of an osteostrican carries, a, you know, there's a scapular coracoid facet there, there's a pectoral fin endoskeleton. We don't know much about it, but we know that it's there. That, that spatial relationship is, is, is original. The, what's problematic is that we have no idea what's inside the paired fins of, for example, thelodonts, and we have no idea what the, en what the endoskeleton that supported that fin was like, or even if there was a scapular coracoid proper. So, so this limits our understanding, but certainly the, the homologues of your arm and your shoulder blade in an osteostrogen would be its pectoral fin and that scapular coracoid there. I think that's unproblematic. The only thing is that that scapular coracoid then plugs into the back of your otic capsule. Well, we hope this, this will not happen uh, with the humans. I'll do my best. Um, all right. Uh, let's thank uh, Per uh, once more. And... Uh, I'd like to make one short announcement, and that is that those of you who belong to the uh, committee, uh, no, what is it called? The council, exactly. Uh, uh, all the council members should take note that we're going to have a council meeting on Friday during lunchtime in the cafeteria, cafeteria uh, downstairs. All right, that's it. Uh, and now there will be a little reception outside, right? And uh, thanks again, Pear. Thank you. Yes, so uh, the, uh, now it's the welcome.